previous episode, we talked about how Islam spread to Egypt. In this session, we're going to be talking about how Islam went all the way up to the Iberian Peninsula and how Tariq ibn Ziyad defeated uh, Roderick, who was one of the Visigoth kings at that time, to cement his legacy, frankly, you know, in, in, that, um, in that area of the world. Before we get to that, though, let's take a step back and think about what's happened so far. We talked about some of the, pro the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and of the Quran about how the Roman Empire will be defeated and the Persian Empire will be defeated and how the, you know, the Jerusalem will be overtaken and how Egypt will be overtaken. And what we're seeing is an incredible manifestation of those things one after the other. Um, we've seen how the Roman Empire was defeated and the Persian Empire was defeated both at the same time, frankly, which was something that's never happened to the Roman Empire before. Um, that they were defeated by one enemy combatant both at the same time. They took out, the, the, the Muslims took out two of the biggest, um, you know, players in, the, in the, the two biggest players in the world, both at the same time. And um, obviously the Jer Jerusalem became uh, property of, uh, of the Muslims. And we talked about some of the tolerance, the tolerance that existed at that time in Jerusalem and how Jews were given rights and Christians were given rights and many lessons were extracted from that lesson. Today, we're going to be talking about how Islam spread through North Africa into the Iberian Peninsula. Now, one thing that needs to be understood is that when Islam spread through North Africa to the Maghreb region, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It wasn't something that was, I mean, a lot of us have this romantic idea that when Islam is spread to any part of the world, that when people are, you know, introduced to Islam for the first time, that they initially, con they just convert spontaneously and it's not something which takes time for them to kind of be acclimatized to. Well, the reality is, that's not necessarily the case. The Berbers, according to some reports that we have, became... Uh, Muslim and apostates 10 times before they finally settled on Islam but when they did settle on Islam of course they changed the course of history because in the year 711 um, Tariq ibn Ziyad who some would some historians say he was a Berber himself with the help of Musa ibn Nusayr who was one of the major uh, player wazirs of that particular time that particular place in the Maghrib they went all the way up to the Iberian Peninsula to conquer the Iberian Peninsula or parts of it uh, one at a time they had city-states that would be conquered one at a time but before we talk about that conquest and what that meant in terms of the course of history and civilization we should talk about quickly how that particular area of the world was and who was inhabiting that particular particular area of the world and in Spain at that particular time you had these people called the Visigoths. Now, the Visigoths were not part of the Roman Empire. In fact, they had splintered away from the Roman Empire some centuries before. And not only had they splintered away from the Roman Empire, but they had defeated the Roman Empire and had been their own independent entity in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and um, in fact, right before this happened, there was a kind of internal discord between the king of the Visigoths in that, uh, in that place called Roderick and a man called Julian, um, who was also someone who was of high prominence. And Julian had a daughter, which according to some historical sources, was uh, deflowered by Roderick. Um, and she was, you know, and Julian wanted to get revenge. And so he brought the Muslims in, you know, to, to, um, to create that, uh, uh, to, to, to avenge, you know, his daughter's reputation and all these things. The extent to which these historical details are true are always going to be subject to historical analysis and discussion. However, the reality is this, is that you had a situation in the Iberian Peninsula where Jewish people were mistreated. You had a, a situation where, you know, uh, th there was cr severe oppression, a, a, a strong system of hierarchy and um, oppression on every level, economic, social and so on and so forth. And so really when the Muslims, it's kind of going back to our previous session we talked about with Egypt itself, where when Christians kind of saw Muslims, there were different reactions, right? In Egypt, they already had their theological discord and they were many of the people became Muslim and it was kind of like a breath of fresh air for them because they wanted to embrace, embrace Islam, which was a respectable monotheism that rid them from the problems of Trinitarianism that they had been struggling with for, the Jacobites had been struggling with for hundreds of years. Uh, here in, in, in Spain, there was a little bit of a different reaction. So different... 
uh, people reacted differently to the, to the conquest. So when when Tariq ibn Ziyad came in and he fought gallantly and brave in a brave manner with the help of Musa ibn Nusayr, they went in and one after the other they would start taking over uh, areas, uh, states uh, in um, in uh, in Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula, including Seville, including uh, Murcia, Zaragoza, and of course Barcelona. Um, now you imagine if that would be continue to be the case, you know, maybe the Barcelona team now would be a completely different makeup. You know, maybe they would be doing sujood, maybe they would be doing, you know, prostration whenever they scored a goal. You know, then Muslim football would be at the top of the, uh, <laughs> you know, of the league. However, obviously. In the, in the case of Spain, it's the only example we have in human history where Islam went all in and then came all out. It's the only example we have in all of human history where Islam came all in and then came all out. And that is an interesting demographic reality. It shows you that what usually, the, 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 the rule is, wherever Islam goes, it stays. But the case of Spain is the only historical exemption from that rule. At any rate, so they took over this place these places and uh, they had uh, wars and um, now there were some of the wars that when Muslims were going forward they progressed all the way up to the south of France they progressed all the way up to the south of France where there was a mountainous region if anyone's been to the south of uh, France you'd know it's very mountainous and for the Arabs who are used to on the Berbers who are used to a desert climate it was completely out of their comfort zone and so of course the, the main man for the Christians, Charles Martel, was able to stunt or stop even the progression of the Muslims in the Battle of uh, Torres. And this was one of the major things that stopped uh, Islam from going all the way up to France. And according to Gombrich, one of the people who wrote you know, a, uh, a brief, concise historical book on the history of the world, he says that had that not happened, he says we would be speaking Arabic right now. So that, that was an important historical event. Speaking about Orientalists, though, we've got to ask the question, what was the civilization of Muslims in Spain? Was it, in fact, convivencia, or the Spanish word meaning coming together, where there is tolerance between Muslims, Christians, or Jews, or was it not? Now, the reality is, you'll find that there is some discussion among historians about the extent to which convivencia happened. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. But you'll find that it's really interesting, even Orientalist scholars, like for example, we've mentioned him before in this series, Sir Thomas Walker Arnold, who wrote this, um, you know, The Preaching of Islam, a very famous book. He says the following about this. He says, during the centuries that elapsed between these two dates, and the two dates that he spoke about are 711, when Tariq ibn Ziyad first came in, and 1502, where the edict of Ferdinand and um, Isabella forbade the exercise of um, Islamic religion throughout the kingdom. And we'll talk about the Inquisition by the end. He says, between those two dates, he says, um, her influence had passed through, provenance, uh, through a province into other countries of Europe, bring, bringing into birth a new poetry and a new culture. And it was from her that Christian scholars received what of Greek philosophy and science they had, uh, they had to stimulate their mental activity up to the time of the Renaissance. In other words, what he is saying what this Orientalist is admitting to here is he is admitting to the fact that because of the civilizational infrastructure in, in, in the Iberian Peninsula at that time, that you had something which catalyzed the Renaissance period itself. Now, this is very serious and very uh, much, you know, you can easily corroborate this with the historical record. I mean, many of the scholars that uh, Muslims, Jews and Christians are familiar with lived in uh, Qurtuba lived, for example, Al Qurtubi. Al Qurtubi, who was a Quran exegete, but one of the major scholars of Islam, and his exegesis of the Quran is one of the most prominent exegesis of all time. Ibn Hazm Al Andalusi, another prominent scholar, who is uh, a Muslim scholar from Al Andalus. From the from 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 the Jewish side, you had Musa ibn Mayun, otherwise known as Maimonides, who was, of course, one of the major scholars of Jewish kalam. And who, in fact, borrowed ideas from um, other mutakallimin, other people of kalam, meaning uh, you could say uh, systematic theology, um, from 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 the Muslim sides. And there was a there was a cultural exchange, 
And this was not something which was limited to, uh, to men, of course. You had Maria of Seville, who was a poet, um, who, was a, who was a prominent poet in Seville, as the name implies, and many other women who would get involved in the, uh, in the culture at that time. Now, the question is, we had such a great, you know, civilization and uh, tolerance, you could say, within that, uh, the Iberian Peninsula. You had all of this cultural exchange to the extent where you had some say 60 or 70 libraries. And one of the grand libraries had 400,000 books. It shows you, I mean, the, if you want to be successful and you want to have the hallmark of a successful civilization is books. And, and meaning, you know, scholasticism, being in, immersed and engaged in scholarly works. When you have a civilization like that, then you have a successful civilization. On the contrary to that is you have book burnings, which symbolize the degradation, the annihilation of civilizations, which of course is starting to creep into the psyche of the Western civilization with Quran burnings. You can't deal with the ideas pertained in the book, so you have to, you're, you're compelled to burn the book. Of course, that is the hallmark of a failed civilization. Not to say that, of course, uh, that the, the American civilizations all failures there are, there are good and bad things in every culture maria man uh, manis manacles her name is maria manacle she's a scholar of this particular time period and she says something really interesting about how jewish people were treated in this in, in this time period she goes under the dima brought by the muslims the jews who who in visigoth hispania had been uh, at the cruel end of social and political uh, of the social and physical spectrum were elevated to the status of Ahl Kitab, people of the book, alongside the Christians. So you see, scholars and historians, when they're looking at how the Jewish community was dealt with in Spain, they 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 are fair. A lot of them are fair, even if they come from the Orient or from the Occident, and they're and they're speaking about these things. Some of them are very fair. And how could you not be when you have someone like Hasdai ibn Shaprut, who is a the you know um, he was from Moorish Spain and he was one of the greatest you know poets and thinkers or you know that the Jewish world has ever known Ma Musab Mayun another one um, and you have you know manuscripts upon manuscripts upon manuscripts of Jewish contributions and how Muslims would value that and that was a cultural exchange so the reality of the situation is when all of this stopped is when the Inquisition, or what you call the Reconquistia, took place, where Spain started to be overtaken by Christian rule one more time. And at that time, you had brutal treatment of Christians, Muslims, and Jews, Christians who were deemed as heretics, and Muslims who had to go into secrecy. You know, they had to go into secrecy. And mosques which were converted into churches, like, for example, the grand mosque in granada that even if you go to this day was converted into a major church in 1502 so the reality is this is not an, this is not a um bashing of christianity or a case to be made against christianity but what, we, what we are saying is that if you want to look at things in history you'll find that anyone can be cruel whether muslim christian or jew there were muslims that were cruel at that period of time as well like al muahidun who were very cruel and very fringe and very extreme and if there's one lesson to take from this is there, there are two reasons you know if you want to simplify things and reduce things to the lowest common denominator that stopped Islam from progressing and staying in that place which is dunya and division you know dunya and division the Muslims you know they were at first united under one uh, you know caliph in, in Hispania Abdul Rahman the third and then after that they started to compete with one another in riches and in extravagance in different city-states. And as a result of this, what happened? You find that there was division among the Muslims and it was easy for an enemy to come into a divided, uh, into a divided enemy like that and to defeat them. And for that reason, uh, Islam, as we said in the beginning of this session, it was all in and then came all out. So the lesson there is, وَاَتَصُمُوا بِحَبُ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Hold on to the rope of Allah altogether and do not become disunited.
Yes, sometimes we'll disagree creedily. Yes, sometimes we'll disagree jurisprudentially. But let's not let those disagreements lead us to be failures on the world scene. We should learn from the we will we should learn from the history from the lesson of history. We should not repeat the same mistake again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.